Man, we're so glad that you are here today. Thanks for coming. And um, man, it's been good. It's been a while since I've had a chance to be up here with this team and uh, lead some worship. A little rusty at that. Um, thanks for being here, though. Man, I love worshiping with our family and getting to uh, kind of come into the presence of God together. But we're going to continue on today with um, the series Revolution. And we're taking some time, actually a lot of weeks here, to walk through chronologically the life of Christ while he was on this earth, his ministry from the time he kind of started ministry uh, to the time of his crucifixion and resurrection. We're going to be doing this um, all the way through uh, Easter, actually. And so this is just giving us a really good picture of who Jesus was and how when he came to this earth, it changed everything. And uh, not only are we doing this on Sunday mornings, but I would encourage you, um, uh, like we just announced, that there are groups on Monday nights. Tomorrow night we'll be here. Um, One of those groups is discussing this very topic a little bit deeper. Uh, There's also a blog that goes out each week, and uh, you can also check back on teachings from previous weeks through our website. And so make sure you're engaging in all those things and kind of go on this journey with us um, as we try to see uh, how this guy, Jesus, changed everything and now can change uh, our lives as well. We're going to continue on with that theme. Um, We've kind of talked about this a few times, but when Jesus came, he didn't just come to like tweak what was already there, right? He didn't come just to do version 2.0 of the, the Jewish religion at the time. He came to bring something totally revolutionary and brand new. And we've talked about that a few times, but today I want to highlight this a little bit more because I want you to hopefully understand the tension that this would have brought to the people that Jesus was talking to while he was here on this earth. And so we're going to be looking at something today called, uh, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. It's actually probably not a sermon that he gave on the mountainside. It is a collection of of teachings that Jesus would have taught many, many times. Um, If you look at what we know from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four guys who wrote what we call the Gospels, who wrote down what Jesus was doing when he was here on this earth, that were eyewitnesses to many of these events. Um, If you go through those four Gospels, we know that it had to have taken according to the number of festivals that are referenced, it had to have taken three years or so of Jesus's ministry. And so we're pretty sure that um, these topics that are in what we call the Sermon on the Mount were not just a one-time deal, but these were probably the collection of core teachings that Jesus would have talked about over and over again. He would have taught these things to lots of different groups, lots of different crowds. And so when we look at them today, A lot of times we look at them as individual things that he taught, individual topics. But I want to kind of look at them all as one big thing and give you a feel for how different his teachings would have been. If you've got your Bibles with you or your um, versions, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 5. This is where we normally look at this. There's a little bit in Luke chapter 6 too that kind of gives you some uh, cross-reference to these topics. But Matthew chapter 5 is where um, we get this collection of things that Jesus would have taught over and over. Now, Matthew is the one out of the four who is writing mostly to Jewish people, right? People who have been brought up in the Jewish religion and the Jewish faith. And so much of what he's doing is he's trying to convince them that this Jesus guy that they've seen is actually the Messiah that they've been looking for. And so he has a a very good background in the Jewish religion. He was brought up that way, and he knows the people that he's talking to would know all the things about how to live according to that religion. And so when he writes in Matthew chapter 5, he's trying to convince them that this Jesus guy is different. We're going to start in Matthew 5, starting with verse 3. We call these the Beatitudes, but just remember this is pro- it's probably a collection of things that he would have said. And he starts off, Jesus does, by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, blessed, that term literally means happy, right? Like, 
I'm in good spirits. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, let's just stop there for a second. Imagine Jesus talking to this crowd of people who were brought up knowing the ancient scriptures, knowing the Jewish religion. One of the first things he says is, look, the people who will be blessed, who will be most happy, who will be most fulfilled are people like those who mourn. They would have thought, what? Those who mourn? How would, how would people who mourn be happy? I mean, that makes no sense. It's not the people who mourn who are happy, but it's the people whose life are going great. Those are the people who will feel blessed. Blessed are the meek. What do you mean, blessed are the meek? I mean, the meek are people who let other people like trample over them and they never get what they want. And I mean, the blessed people are the power brokers, right? The, the people who have the power and can um, make their desires come true. I mean, those are the people who are blessed, right? And he goes on. Verse 7, he says, blessed are the merciful. Not the people who grab what they want, not the people who demand justice, but blessed are the people who show mercy, who show grace. Blessed are the pure in heart, not the ceremonially clean, not the people who like uh, did all the right things on the outside, not the people who went through all the right rituals and, and practiced all the right, the right laws, not the people who did all these outward signs of, of being clean, but blessed are the pure in heart. The people ha have the motives right on the inside. Blessed are the peacemakers. The peacemakers, not, not the ones who fight for what they want. I mean, aren't the people who go grab what they want, aren't those the ones that get blessed? Well, how, how are peacemakers blessed? And blessed are those who are persecuted. Because of righteousness. That doesn't sound very blessed to me, right? Blessed are those who are persecuted. Why would I feel blessed if I'm persecuted? And the last one, he says, blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. So just imagine this crowd sitting there going, what is this guy talking about? Like, this is totally opposite of what we know about this world, right? This is not reality. This is not the way we live. None of that that you just said, Jesus, sounds like I'm very blessed, like I'm very happy. And he goes on, he says, well, not only is that the way things are in this new kingdom that I'm bringing, but there's something else, too. In verse 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. You are the people who are going to influence the rest of the world. You're going to be the salt and the light, the thing that infiltrates the rest of the world. And they would have looked at Jesus going, Jesus, what are you talking about? Like, we're this little community that lives together inside this huge Roman empire, and we can't do anything on our own. We're, we're powerless, right? We're told what we can do. How in the world are we going to be the ones that have the influence in the entire world? And in verse 16, Jesus takes it one step further. And he says, in the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In the same way, let your light be the influence before others. Now, this would have been totally radical because the Jews were taught that the others were people you did not associate with. They don't like the others, right? The people outside of the Israelite nation. They don't 
want to associate with them. In fact, they've been told, don't eat with them, don't dine with them, don't go into their houses, don't eat the same foods, don't have anything to do with them. Don't marry them, don't get all mixed up in their rituals, stay away from them. In fact, build a wall around yourselves to keep them out, right? Expel the foreigner from within you know, get rid of it. Try to keep yourselves isolated. Now Jesus comes along and he says, no, listen, um, you're going to let your light shine to all the others in the world, to the people who are not like you. And when you do that, other people are going to glorify God, to which they would have said, I don't really care if they glorify God. We don't want them to glorify God. We want them to fear our God. All right, we want to go back to the days of David, where King David, man, when he had his armies and God was with him, the, the people that were around King David, they feared our God. They, they ran away when they heard what our God could do. That's the Messiah we're looking for. We're looking for the Messiah that comes and reestablishes our kingdom and elevates us to the place of power. Not us being a light to other people that would turn them to glorify our God. Radical, total, upside-down teaching from what they would have known growing up. And I think God, or Jesus, knew that there would be uh, some pushback on this, right? There had to be people sitting and hearing these teachings and thinking, who is this guy? Like, where is this coming from? This, this doesn't line up with the stuff I know. Like, think for yourselves, if someone came in and started teaching to you something that was totally opposite of what you had grown up with or what you had been taught, um, if you even grew up in church, you know, somebody came in and said, hey, everything you learn is going to change. And here is the way it's going to be from now on. And so Jesus knew there would be some tension there as he was drawing out the things that were going to be different from here on out. And so in verse 17, he kind of addresses it before they can even ask the question, right? He says, now look, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them. To which I think a lot of people would have went, okay, because you were getting a little out there, Jesus. I mean, you were going a little too far to the edges. And I, I was starting to wonder what you were saying. He says, look, don't think that I've come to abolish. And that word abolish that we translate as abolish means don't think I've come to destroy, right? To decimate, to subvert the old law and prophets. And whenever in scripture you see law and the prophets, what they're referring to is what we know today now as our Old Testament. The law was the first five books, and the prophets included uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, those things that we have in our Old Testament. Because remember, back when this is written, right, there is no Old and New Testament, right? The only scriptures they had were what we now know as the Old Testament. The New Testament hadn't been written yet when Jesus was on this earth. And so he comes and says, look, all the things that you've learned, all, everything that came from your scripture... I have not come to abolish or destroy it. And they would have gone, man, good. Okay, so we can still follow this guy because he's not like going against everything um, that we've been taught so far. But then he puts in this one little word, and it's a huge word. He says, but. And whenever you see that word, you know something else is coming, right? And he puts that word in there and basically to, to say, that tension that you're feeling, that sense that something is changing is right. If you're sitting there thinking it, you're trying to say that something's going to be different, then you're catching on because it is going to be different from here on out. It says, I've not come to abolish, to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them, to fulfill them. And that word to fulfill, we translate, means to render 
complete. And what Jesus is basically saying is, look, all those things that you've learned, law of prophets, the way you've lived your life, the religion that you followed so far, all of that is now complete. All that way of doing life has a shelf life. There's an end to it. It doesn't continue forever. And I'm telling you now that I'm here that I am the one that is completing and ending the old way of doing things. And I'm bringing in, I'm ushering in something brand new. The way it used to be is now obsolete. They basically said, the way you've lived up to this point is by the law. But now I'm bringing a new way of living, a new system. Whenever he talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, what he's saying is there's a new way of living, and this new way of living is love. This way is done. It's fulfilled. I've completed it. There's something new. And I think Jesus would have known that that would have caused some real defensiveness in people and some confusion. And what are you trying to say? And so he gives them some examples. And these are the examples that we uh, many times have looked at in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. These types of examples where he starts off by saying something like, you have heard it said that. You've heard it taught this way. You've heard it said, but I tell you. He says, look, there, I know the way you've lived so far. You've heard it this way. You've lived it this way. You've grown up with it this way. But now I'm telling you there's a new way. And he goes through multiple examples of this. Things like, he says, you've heard it said, do not murder. Do not murder. It's one of the Ten Commandments, right? That's the way you've been brought up. Do not murder. But I tell you, if you even get angry, if you even have anger towards someone, there's still an issue there. It's still not okay. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, don't even look at someone with lust. Say, you've heard it said that your action, those outside things that we look at, those behaviors by the law, did I do this? Did I do this? Is this action correct? You've heard it said, don't commit adultery. I'm telling you there's a new standard now, and it's love. So I'm telling you, don't even look at someone lustfully. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, meaning that it's okay for you to repay someone at the same level, to find justice um, for things that have gone wrong. But I'm telling you, turn the other cheek. That in my kingdom, in my way of living, you're supposed to show mercy and grace. You have heard it said, love your enemy." or love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is totally radical teaching. He's basically saying, I know you've done it one way all your life, but I'm telling you that way of doing it is done, and now there is a new way of living. In my kingdom, the way to live is love. Now, What's the difference between these two? When we live by law, whether it's in um, our relationship with God or our relationship with others or even in the laws we have in this country, what laws do is they establish a minimum requirement, right? A minimum requirement. A, you can't do this or you have to do this. You have to at least get to this level. So do not murder. So the minimum requirement is that you don't murder anybody. Okay, check. Did that. Minimum requirement, you know, is that uh, 
you don't commit adultery. Okay, check. Didn't do that. You know, the minimum requirement are all these things that you have to say, if I can just get to that level, then I'm okay. That's all I got to do. And Jesus comes in, he says, you've been living by minimum requirements for a long time, but now I'm changing it because now I'm talking about living by love. And for love, there's no minimum standard you have to reach. There's always a next level. There's always another step to take, another thing to do, another way to show love. You're never done with love. There's no arrival. There's no time when you fulfilled it or reached it. Because see, with laws, they deal with outside actions. And you can be someone who follows all the laws, and your outside actions are all fine. But just because you follow all the laws doesn't mean that your heart is in the right place. I mean, we're almost wired, right, to find loopholes in laws. right? What's the way that I can meet the minimum requirement? but I can still get around it and subvert it and kind of do what I want to do or gain what I want to gain, even though I can still say I met the letter of the law, which is why we have to keep producing new laws. You know, you've heard the phrase, um, you can't legislate morality. And this is why, because we will always find a way around a law to get what we want. As long as we can say we met, met that minimum requirement, we think we're good and we, we'll find a way around it. Just because we meet the letter of the law doesn't mean our heart is in the right place. And Jesus comes along and he says, that we're not going to do it that way anymore. That's the old way. This doesn't guarantee that your heart is right. We're going to do it this way now. We're going to focus on the things that are on the inside, not just the external behaviors, because law is about behaviors or actions, right? It's about external things. Love is about motive. What's the reason behind the action? What's the why behind what I do? Here's another difference. Laws are universal. Laws are universal. Meaning, we make laws in this country that apply to everyone equally. The problem is that there are times, and you may know someone who's gotten caught up in this, that a law can be good for 99% of the people, but actually hurt the other 1%. Because laws are universal. They're blanket statements. Love has room to be individual. Love has space for us to say, you have a story. And your story makes a difference for how we react to the things you do. And when I'm loving, I can ask the question, what does love require? What's the best thing for you? What is the thing that shows you that you are loved and helps move you along to a richer life and a better relationship with God. And that can be different from individual to individual. There's room for that in the kingdom, in the covenant that Jesus is bringing. And laws, when we follow them, lead to pride. That's what happened to the Pharisees. If I can show you by my actions that I can meet all the laws, then there's a pride that goes with that. Look at me. Look at how I've fulfilled all the minimum requirements. But in love, it produces humility. Because love sees the standard that Jesus set when he died on the cross for us. It helps us to see that there is no meeting requirement a minimum requirement, that it always asks for you to go the next step. This is so much simpler, 
but it's much more demanding. Because you have to go way beyond the outside actions and work on the motives behind the actions. And when you start looking at it this way, that this is what Jesus was bringing into the world, this is what he came to change, this is why he came and said, I don't come to abolish all this, but I've come to fulfill it, and there's something new, and there's something better, and my kingdom is going to look different than it's looked up to this point. The New Testament, what we know is the New Testament, begins to come alive, begins to make sense. Scriptures like Matthew 22, and you may have heard this before, Somebody asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus replies, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then he says this, all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. He basically says, look, you get this right, you start living the way I'm telling you to live, you easily fulfill all this stuff that we had detailed out before in the law. You follow this way of living, not only do you get all this, you get so much more than this. That's what it means when he says, I've come to fulfill it. I've come to show you a new way that if you follow this way, we don't have to worry about all the other laws because they get fulfilled when you love God with all your heart and when you love others the way you want to be loved. Scripture like Galatians 5 where Paul's talking and he says, For in Christ Jesus the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Like if you get nothing else right, the, the thing that matters most is Faith expressing itself in love, living the new way that Jesus has called us to live. And does this matter to us today? I mean, I hope you could see the tension that this would have put into people, the, you know, the struggle it would have been where they're basically saying, but wait, this is all I've ever known, and now you're showing me something brand new. I hope you sense that, and and I'm actually hoping a little bit that some of it brings tension to you. So I think it's important for us to realize that this was not just a new way of doing a religion that Jesus brought. It's a new way of living. You see, I think it matters to us today, to be honest, because some of us are still living like this in our marriage. Right? What's the minimum requirement that I have to do in our relationship so that I can say I'm okay? So it's not my fault if things go wrong. Tell me the list of things that I have to do. How many times do I have to take out the trash? How many times do I need to help with dinner? How many, times, how many hours do I need to spend with you this week? How many things do I need to do so that I can meet the minimum requirements and if things go bad between us, if things still aren't uh, going well in our relationship, it's not my fault because I met the minimum requirements. And Jesus comes, he says, not if you're living in my kingdom. It's not how it works. Because love doesn't keep record of wrongs. Love doesn't keep score. There is no minimum requirement that you meet and you're okay. Love always goes the extra mile. Some of you may be doing that in your jobs. What's my job description? Write it down for me so that I know the minimum requirements of what I'm supposed to do. What's my responsibility and what's everybody else's responsibility? So if I can check off my to-do list and the project goes bad, it's not my fault. Blame it on somebody else. That's law living. Jesus says, that's not the way we're going to do it in my kingdom. Love says, what's best for everybody? What do I have to do to go to the extra mile for everyone else? What do I have to do to show grace to other people? 
And then the reality is that many of us still live this way in our relationship with God. God, what's the minimum I need to do? What are the requirements? God, give me the list so that I can feel good about myself. You know, am I okay if I go to church once a month? Maybe I volunteer in a community organization. Maybe I give a little money to some nonprofits. Is that, am I good? Is that good enough? Are you and I okay? Jesus would say, no, 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 no. You're asking the wrong questions. It's not the way we live. What I came to bring to this world was a new way of life where loving God and loving others becomes the sole focus of everything we do. And so the question is not, God, is this enough? It's, God, what do you want from me? And when you ask that question, the answer will come back, everything. I want it all. I want your time. I want your attention. I want your willingness to show love to the people that I love. I want you to stop worrying about if you've done enough and start worrying about what can I do, what's best for the other person. God, what can I do with my life for you so that you get the glory? I want to challenge you this morning. Is there a place in your life where you're still living under the old covenant, the old way of doing things, the old law, the way of minimum requirements. And you need to say, if you want to be a part of living the way Jesus came, the kingdom he instituted, if you want to be a part of his kingdom, you've got to switch to this. It's got to be driven by what's happening on the inside, not just our behaviors. And if we do that, Everything else gets fulfilled. I'm going to challenge you to think about that this week, but I want to tell you that if there's a little tension in you, if there's a little struggle in you, that's good. And if that's true, you do not want to miss next week. Because if you think this produced some tension, what we're going to look at next week is something that Jesus said that was going to take it even a step further. And at the same time, it's going to give us a verifiable way that we today can even see that what Jesus was saying is really true. What he predicted about changing everything in this world is true. Let me pray for you. God, thank you for showing us a new way of living. And even as I've studied that this week, God, I've been... uh, challenged to look at different places in my life where I didn't even realize I was still living by a law kind of mindset. And God, it was easy for me to compartmentalize, you know, this new covenant, this new way of doing things that you brought through your son. As just, you know, as long as I'm doing that in the religious area, in the spiritual areas of my life. And what I realize now, God, is that you've called us to live an entirely new way of living in every area of our life. So God, help us to root out any of that minimum requirement thinking. Remind us through your Holy Spirit when we're in situations where we want to just Ask, you know, are we okay? Did I do enough for myself so that I don't have to feel bad or feel guilty? And and switch our mindset to say, wait a second. What does love require of me? What would love say that I need to do in this situation? And then God, when we hear that voice, when we hear the Spirit speaking to us, I just pray that you'll allow us to be obedient in action. We want to live in your kingdom in the way of love. In your name we pray.